We find ourselves again this morning in the book of Philippians. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. In 17th century England, the Puritan preacher John Bunyan found himself in prison for failing to conform to the doctrines of the Anglican Church. The magistrates who were inclined to release him had made it known to him that he was free to go as soon as he pleased, as long as he would stop preaching. Bunyan is reported to have said to their offer, if you release me today, I will preach tomorrow. In fact, Bunyan never waited for his release to continue preaching. It's recorded that, that Bunyan went right on preaching in the courtyard of that jail in such a compelling manner and in such a loud voice that people would actually gather to the prison each day to hear him preaching from the inside. They would gather outside and they could hear him preaching from the inside of the prison. Eventually, the guards placed him deep in the center of the prison so that he couldn't be heard. And for much of the next decade, he was condemned to solitude and silence. But it was in that silence that he would speak the loudest of all, as he used that time to write The Pilgrim's Progress, perhaps the most popular Christian book outside the Bible itself. And through that book, he continues to preach to millions of Christians today, spanning multiple centuries, and I'm sure will continue into the future. Less than a hundred years after that, Jonathan Edwards, a man whom God used so mightily in the salvation of souls in the First Great Awakening, was dismissed from his church in Northampton. The greatest preacher that America ever produced was fired from his church. Once he was the pastor of a, a, a congregation of over a thousand members, but America's greatest theologian found himself in Stockbridge, Massachusetts where he would labor in obscurity for the next seven years among the Mohican and Mohawk Indians. But far from being the exile his disillusioned congregation had supposed that it would be, those seven years turned out to be the most productive of his life. In that time, he wrote several of his most important writings, such as the dissertation concerning the end for which God created the world and his classic works on original sin and the freedom of the will. And each of these are regarded as, as theological classics, required reading on the, in the subjects that they, that they treat. In the cases of both these faithful saints, the Lord used circumstances that anyone would have supposed would have been a hindrance to their ministry to actually further their ministry of the gospel. And the response of these men in such circumstances, in such adversity, was not to complain and it was not to blame God. It was not to sink into discontentment and depression. Instead, their response was to rejoice. And they certainly weren't rejoicing in pleasant circumstances. They weren't rejoicing in an easy life, certainly. They weren't rejo rejoicing in a good reputation. No, their joy was found in the advance of the gospel. These great saints could endure opposition from both friends and enemies they could decrease into insignificance and obscurity. They could suffer hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ because their ministry wasn't driven by a thirst for prominence, but by the advance of the gospel. Theirs was a gospel-driven ministry. And in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 18, we learn that Bunyan and Edwards were simply following in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul, whose imprisonment God used and sovereignly ordained for the advance of the gospel. And despite adverse circumstances, discomforts, opposition, Paul rejoiced. But just as others, his ministry wasn't driven by a lust for comfort, by a lust for prominence or a lust for prestige. The same way that Bunyan and Edwards were focused on the advance of the gospel, Paul was engaging in a gospel-driven ministry. And this is fitting for the book of the Philippians, which we have subtitled, A Gospel-Driven Life. As we've said before, Paul's main concern in this letter to the Philippians is, chapter 1, verse 27, that they would conduct themselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, that their lives would be founded upon and driven by the truths of what Christ has accomplished in the gospel. 
And over the past two weeks, we've looked at how that concern for a gospel-driven life has characterized the op his opening prayer for the Philippians. Right in verses 3 to 8, we learn that gospel-driven fellowship breeds joyful, confident, and affectionate thanksgiving. And then, in last week, last week in verses 9 through 11, we saw that gospel-driven prayer issues in supplication to God on behalf of our fellow Christians for their growth in love, discernment, integrity, and fruitfulness, all of which abound to the glory of God. And so it's fitting this morning in verses 12 to 18 to consider Paul's gospel-driven ministry. We've had gospel-driven fellowship. We've had gospel-driven prayer. And we come this morning to gospel-driven ministry. So let's read the text together. Philippians 1, verses 12 to 18. Paul writes, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition." rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. So Paul states the main point of this paragraph right at the beginning. He wants to inform his brothers and sisters in Philippi about how things are going with him. This is one of the reasons that the Philippians had sent Epaphroditus to Paul. In addition to, to bringing him their financial gift and then ministering personally to Paul, meeting whatever needs and, uh, that he would need help with, Epaphroditus would also return to Philippi with news of how Paul is faring, how his trial is going, and if he had any instructions for them. Remember, it had been about four years since the Philippians last saw Paul. And in that time, they've heard of his arrests, They've heard of his trial before Felix and Festus and Agrippa. And they heard how he had appealed to Caesar and then was on his way to Rome and there was the shipwreck, but he was delivered out of it. And then they've heard about his imprisonment once he got to Rome and how he was in, on house arrest and was waiting to stand trial before Nero. And they realized that these were not optimum conditions for anyone. So how was Paul holding up? How... Was his imprisonment treating him? Was it, was, he, was it discouraging to him? Was he losing heart? Would he be released? Could he return to Philippi and help with the issues of disunity in the church and strengthen them in the face of persecution and false teaching? Or would he die in Rome and their sweet partnership in the gospel die with him? And perhaps most important of all, they want to know, how has your loss of freedom, Paul, how has this loss of freedom affected the spread of the gospel? How is the ministry going? And so Paul begins the body of this letter by informing them of how things are going with him. He wants to allay any concerns or fears they might have about the difficulty of his circumstances and let them know that amidst all of his troubles, he's rejoicing. And he is rejoicing for two reasons. And those two reasons for which Paul rejoices will be our outline this morning. Two reasons for which Paul rejoices. Number one, Paul rejoices because the gospel is advancing despite opposition. And number two, he rejoices because Christ is being preached despite impure motives. And we'll go through both of those. The gospel is advancing despite opposition and Christ is being preached despite impure motives. So first, the gospel is advancing despite opposition. Let's read verse 12 again together. He begins, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Or as the ESV renders it, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. You see, the Philippians were concerned that, that Paul's adverse circumstances had dealt a blow to his ministry of the gospel to the Gentiles for which they had known him to be sent as an apostle of Christ. And Paul reassures them right off the bat 
that far from being a hindrance to that gospel ministry, this opposition, this imprisonment has actually served to advance the gospel. And there are two significant ways that the gospel has advanced as a result of Paul's imprisonment, outside the church and inside. So let's look at the first one. Paul, the gospel is advanced outside the Christian community. Verses 12 and 13, he says, My circumstances have really served to advance the gospel, verse 13, so that, or such that, or with the result that, my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. Now, the Praetorian Guard was a, an elite company of 9,000 soldiers that were particularly tasked to protect the emperor and his interests. And it seems that this subversive preacher, Paul, was a high-priority case for Nero because he was being guarded around the clock by the emperor's personal elite class of soldiers. He mentions, Paul mentions his bonds three times in this passage in verses 13, 14, and 17. That's the Greek word desmos, which the NAS translates as imprisonment in this passage. But in, in Acts 28, 20, when Paul first comes to Rome as a prisoner, he speaks of, his, uh, of wearing this chain for the hope of Israel, Acts 28, 20. And in Ephesians 6, 20, he calls himself an ambassador in chains. Now, this word for chain isn't desmos, it's a word halusis. And halusis was an 18-inch long, maybe about that big, 18-inch long chain that was attached at one end to a handcuff around Paul's wrist and at another end to a handcuff around the wrist of a Roman soldier, about this far apart. So Paul didn't pass an hour of the day when he wasn't chained to a Roman soldier. But it wasn't the same guard every day. The soldiers had lives and they took shifts of six hours at a time. So that meant that for nearly two years, Paul came into contact with four different imperial soldiers each day and had them at his disposal for a period of six hours at a time. That's amazing. That is a captive audience. So what do you think Paul talked about? Do you think he said things like, you know, this isn't fair. Oh, what injustice. I've been waiting two years. This is not a quick and speedy trial. I'm a Roman citizen. How would you have reacted? Would you have Complained about the lack of privacy? You're this far away from someone else for your entire life for two years. Would you have blamed God for your unjust imprisonment? Questioned him? Asked him why in an accusatory fashion? Paul didn't do any of those things. He knew a captive audience when he saw one. And so he used this opportunity as, an, as, a, as a platform to advance the gospel. And that's exactly what he did. You can imagine the guard would ask, so what are you in for? What would you do? And Paul would respond, I am in these chains because I serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the one true and living God. God made flesh in the person of a Jewish carpenter. And in further humility and obedience to the Word of God, he died for sinners on a Roman cross under Roman authority 30 years ago in Israel. And he was buried and he was laid in a tomb with Roman soldiers kept guarding it, keeping it secure. But three days later, he rose from that grave and, and he demonstrated his triumph over death. And after remaining with his disciples for 40 days, he ascended into heaven before their very eyes. And, and is this very moment enthroned in power at the right hand of God as Lord of the world, Lord not Lord Caesar, but Lord Jesus. And not long after his ascension, while I was persecuting his followers for corrupting the Jewish religion, putting them into chains like these, this resurrected Jesus himself appeared to me in a blazing light. He knocked me down to the ground and he struck me blind and he told me that I was going to be his messenger to the Gentiles, to the nations, to preach this gospel and to strengthen this church that I once labored to destroy. And since that day, I have given every waking moment of my life to preaching the good news that because of his life and his death and his resurrection, those who simply turn from their own self-righteousness and trust in him can be forgiven of their sins and escape the punishment of God that we all fear and can be reconciled to him as sons. 
And one day soon, this same Jesus is going to break through the clouds and return to earth and set up his kingdom to to rule over all nations. Could you imagine Paul saying that to the guard? What a subversive teaching it would be to hear from a Roman soldier to hear that. But as they spoke with him and heard this gospel and observed his character, they learned that he wasn't in prison as a criminal but because he was faithfully preaching the lordship of Jesus. And this is the word that spread throughout the whole guard. They would talk with each other and they would wonder with each other. This man hasn't broken any laws. All he has to do to be released is to recant this teaching about Jesus of Nazareth. And he'd be free to go, but he he won't do it. He'd rather lose his head than abandon this message. And as they heard this gospel and they observed the, the virtue and the consistent devotion of Paul's life, that his behavior matched his message, they began to believe. God granted them repentance and faith, one by one. So much so that Paul could close the letter to the Philippians, chapter 4, verse 22, by saying, all the saints greet you, especially those in Caesar's household. Now, step back a minute and think what we're talking about. Think about how badly Paul desired to preach the gospel in Rome. He wrote in Romans chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he says, For God is my witness as, as to how unceasingly I make mention of you, always in my prayers, making request, if perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. In verse 13, he says, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far. So Paul wanted to go to Rome. He was convinced of the importance of taking the gospel to the very center of ancient paganism and then using the momentum of that, that he would have gained in Rome as a vehicle to further ministry, right? He wanted to go to Spain right after that. But I'm sure that he never imagined that he would be converting the emperor's imperial guard one by one. We need to marvel at the sovereignty of God here. I mean, just as Bunyan's imprisonment resulted in Pilgrim's progress and Edward's exile resulted in some of the the most beautiful, sound, refined theological works ever written, so God has ordained efforts to thwart the progress of the gospel to be the very means of advancing it. And Paul sees that clearly. He receives this imprisonment not as a failure in God's plan, not as a hiccup, but as being ordained by God to accomplish his sovereign will. And let me make this plain. This is not Paul saying, well, I guess everything happens for a reason. You know, Paul, as if he was some believer in blind fate or that an impersonal force like karma was governing the universe. This was not that. Paul had had good theology. He understood that this was the, the direct plan and providence of a purposeful God God wasn't just making the best out of a bad situation here. Oh, well, they got him. He's in prison. So I guess I'll give him a few Roman soldiers to, you know, keep him warm, keep him happy. No way. Through the sovereign outworking of the sovereign plan of God, Paul has become the Trojan horse, literally right in the middle of the Roman Empire. If you read through the book of Acts, he's, the Lord Jesus comes to Paul in the night and says, don't, don't fear, you've got to go to Rome. When he's on the ship, he says to the people, don't worry about it. Don't do what you're thinking about doing. Don't throw anybody over. God has told me that I need to go to Caesar. Don't don't worry. God, this is God's plan the whole time. So what can we learn from this? For one thing, we can learn to receive life's trials as opportunities sent directly from him to advance the gospel. We shouldn't try to cut the legs out from under the sovereignty of God by suggesting that God just passively allows our trials or makes the best out of a bad situation. When confronted with suffering, we should see that the sovereign Lord of the universe is purposefully giving us an opportunity to make much of Him and to make much of His gospel in our response. And that leads to another lesson. It's not very often that the world is impressed with Christians who praise Jesus when everything in their life is just peachy. Well, sure, you believe in God, 
You look at, he's doing everything right for you. That was Satan's complaint against Job. Well, sure, Job is a righteous man. Look at what you've given him. But when we can endure pain and hardship and suffering and loss and praise Jesus, then the unbelieving world sits up and takes notice. So don't waste your suffering by trying to pin it on Satan. And don't waste it by trying to avoid it all the time and get rid of it at all costs. Receive suffering as an opportunity to put the, su the supremacy of Christ on display in the way that you respond to it. Another lesson, finally, we can take advantage of our captive audiences. Now, none of us are going to be prison, uh, chained to a Roman soldier, put in prison, I hope, anyway. But maybe some of you are chained to a desk at work. Maybe some of you are chained to a kitchen sink and to three little kids running around at home. Maybe some of you are chained to a hospital bed and you can't move about freely as you'd like. Paul knows what you're going through. And like he did, you need to see each of those chains as an opportunity to, to proclaim Christ from exactly where you are. You can be a witness to your coworkers. You can bear witness of the gospel to your kids, to your nurse, and to your doctors. Because the messenger might be in chains, but by God's grace, the word of God is not imprisoned. But the gospel was advancing not only outside the Christian community in the Praetorian Guard, but also inside the Christian community. Take a look at verse 14. He says, And most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So not only is the gospel advancing through Paul's ministry of the gospel to imperial soldiers, but Paul's imprisonment and sufferings in the cause of the gospel have emboldened other believers in Rome to go on proclaiming the gospel without fear of consequences. They needed it. They were the Roman Christians. The emperor was in their backyard. How are they going to be faithful Christians with the man right there, the one who could kill them, put them to death, take, destroy their family, take their possessions? They looked to Paul and got boldness from his example. One commentator put it this way. He said, the chains that bound Paul liberated others to speak the word of God fearlessly. In 1555 in Oxford, England, the famous English reformers Hugh, Lat Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley were burned at the stake under the reign of Bloody Mary for their refusal to adhere to Roman Catholicism. And with sacks of gunpowder hanging around their neck, as the executioner brought the flaming torch, Latimer looked at his friend and said, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England, as I trust, shall never be put out. What does Latimer mean when he says he's going to light a candle that wouldn't be put out? He meant that by their sacrifice, by their unwavering resolve to treasure the truth even unto the pain of death, that their example would strengthen the resolve of those who would come after them to suffer just as they had. Others would hear of their story and think the gospel was worth these two men's lives. Surely my life isn't worth more than theirs. You see, courage is contagious. I don't know about you, but I'm far more likely to do something if someone else comes with me or does it before me to blaze the trail. And that's especially the case with evangelism. It is easier to, evangelism on a to do evangelism on a team. If somebody is with you, in the trenches with you, holding you up, encouraging you, dealing with the mockery and the suffering that comes as a result with you. And by standing up to the emperor, Paul was blazing the trail for the Roman Christians to proclaim the gospel without fear of those consequences. And friends, the Lord Jesus has done that for us. He, he has gone ahead of us. He has suffered outside the gate of the camp of Israel in order to sanctify his people through his blood, Hebrews says. And then he goes on to say, Hebrews 12, or 13, verse 13 says, So let us go out to him, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, 
but we are seeking the city which is to come. You see, Christ has blazed the trail so that we can walk in his footsteps. So that as Philippians 3.10 says, we might know the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that we might also attain to the resurrection of the dead, to be reunited with him forever. And so as the Philippians are, are wondering about how Paul's doing, he makes sure to inform them that despite opposition, despite hardship, despite affliction, even despite Paul's losing his freedom and being prevented from traveling freely to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles where Christ isn't named, the gospel is advancing and progressing. The messenger is shackled in chains and confined to a Roman prison, but 2 Timothy 2.9, the word of God is not imprisoned. Not only are many in Caesar's household hearing the message and being saved, but other believers are hearing of Paul's trials and of his relentless preaching, notwithstanding the consequences in the opposition, such that they themselves are being stirred up to boldness and fearless proclamation in the midst of that same adversity. But among those emboldened believers, there are two groups of preachers. Let's look at verses 15 to 18. Paul says, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. So the first reason that Paul rejoices is because the gospel is advancing despite opposition. But the second reason is that Christ is proclaimed despite impure motives. Christ is proclaimed despite impure motives. And as I said a moment ago, what we have here in verse 15 is two different groups of preachers. There are those preaching Christ that are motivated by envy and strife, or some translations have envy and rivalry. And then there are those preaching Christ who are motivated by goodwill. Let's take a look at the first group first. Now, to describe this group of preachers as proclaiming Christ from envy and strife, that's a little mind-blowing. I mean, these two words show up often together in the New Testament, but in various lists of vices, things that Paul condemns that characterize the unredeemed life. They both appear in Paul's list of, the work, uh, uh, list of the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 to 21. And they appear in Romans 1, 28 and 29 as Paul lists envy and strife as evidence of a depraved mind. Envy and strife are the results of controversies instigated by false teachers in 1 Timothy 6, 3 and uh, 4. And according to Titus 3, 3, Envy characterizes people who are enslaved to various lusts, pleasures, lusts and pleasures. And strife, according to Titus 3, 9 through 11, is a mark of those who are factious, perverted, and self-condemned. These are heavy words. Strife speaks of discord, of rivalry, of contention. It's the opposite of peace and harmony and fellowship. And envy, though we often think of it as just a synonym for jealousy, like I want something that somebody else has, the force of this Greek word thronos is more about depriving the other person of the thing to be enjoyed. Just, just think about that kind of ill will for a second. Think about how mean-spirited you've got to be to get to a point where you don't even care if you have something enjoyable. You just don't want anybody else to have it either. Now, you hear all that and you say, now, can these preachers really be Christians? I mean, just listen to the way they're described. That doesn't sound very Christian at all to me. It doesn't sound very Christian at all to me either. But nevertheless, and as we are all far too familiar with, we who have been redeemed and clothed with the righteousness of Christ often forget who we are in Him. And we continue to put on the deeds of darkness. Though the penalty of sin has been paid for and the, the power of sin has been broken, the presence of sin is still very much manifest in our flesh. We have not yet been made perfect. We continue to do battle with the flesh until the day of Christ Jesus. 
But just as an aside, do you, do you notice how repulsed you are by the idea that these notions of envy and strife could exist in Christians? Do you feel how unattractive that is to you as we go through and read those things? Just ask yourselves, am I that repulsed by my own sin? By the fact that I am redeemed, redeemed. I am a blood-washed, bought follower of Jesus Christ. And yet I do the things that I do. It's just something to think about. It's always good to harness the, the hatred and the antipathy for sin that arises when we, when we consider its ugliness and to harness that as, as fuel for the battle for holiness. So take that with you. But yes, these are actually Christians who are described this way. They are not pseudo-Christians. They are not wolves in sheep's clothing. And we know this for a couple of reasons. One, verse 15 begins by saying, some to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. Some of who? If you trace the pronoun some back to find its antecedent, you run right into the word brethren in verse 14. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some of those brethren are preaching Christ from envy and strife. And if you go on in verse 15, Paul says, but some also from goodwill. So the ones who are preaching from envy and strife and the ones who are preaching from goodwill are part of the same group, part of the same brethren that are mentioned in verse 14. Besides this, both groups of preachers are said to preach Christ. Paul says it in verse 15 almost like he expects that we're going to question him. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife. And later in verse 17, he would say the same thing, that this group proclaims Christ. So this impurely motivated group of preachers is nevertheless proclaiming the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Even, you know, if they weren't, we'd certainly know it from Paul's reaction. This wasn't a man who was soft on false teaching. This is the same person who wrote to the Galatians, if any man, if we or an angel from heaven comes to you, preaches a gospel different than the one you've received, let him be accursed. One translation says, let him be condemned to hell. Even later in this letter, chapter 3, verse 2, Paul tells, uh, calls the false teachers dogs, evil workers, and mutilators of the flesh. This is not a man who is soft on false teaching. But here in our text... He doesn't condemn these people. He doesn't harshly ridicule, ridicule them. No, he rejoices. He rejoices because they're preaching Christ, he says. So these are not teachers who are subtracting from the gospel like some in Corinth who were questioning the bodily re resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. These aren't the preachers who are trying to add to the gospel like the Judaizers in Galatians. These preachers in Rome are fellow believers in Christ whose quarrel with Paul wasn't doctrinal, it was personal. So not only do these preachers preach Christ out of envy and strife, Paul goes on to tell us in verse 17 that they're also motivated by selfish ambition. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives. This Greek term that we translate there, selfish ambition, was used of career professionals who ruthlessly tried to climb to the top of their fields of business in any way they could. This is the cutthroat corporate ladder climbing. It was also used of politicians who sought to attain office at any expense. So whatever the cost, these people were going to see to it that they became prominent. They wanted the limelight. So let's try to imagine the scene there in Rome. By the time Paul writes Philippians, he's been under house arrest for nearly two years. And it's doubtless that the Christians in Rome had heard of his coming and had anxiously awaited the results of his trial because they knew that, hey, if he dies, uh, we believe what he believes, we're, we're next. So they were anxiously awaiting the, the deliberation, the verdict. And during those two years, as Acts 28.30 says, Paul would welcome visits from all who came to him. He had visitors all the time. And perhaps one of those visitors came to him and explained that there was a group of preachers in Rome who were preaching the true gospel but were antagonistic against him. They envied Paul. Perhaps they were jealous of his success and prominence in the ministry. I mean, after all, there was no one more prominent in Christian circles than the Apostle Paul in the days of those missionary journeys. The whole world was being infiltrated by the gospel of Christ at this man's hand. Perhaps they were envious of his giftedness or his intellect or 
the respect and love that he enjoyed in all the churches. They were contentious. They were pugnacious, always spoiling for a fight, the kind of people who loved a good battle, who would argue about anything, and it, it cloaked in the name of love for truth. Wouldn't be really love for truth. It'd be from selfish ambition. But they would. You. Oh, I, uh, we have to be. We have to be right about the truth. And so, we're going to argue about every single little detail, the foolish quarrels and endless discussions that Paul condemns later uh, elsewhere in his epistles. And they were motivated, as the, the text says, by selfish ambition. They desired to to rise to prominence in the evangelical scene. They could not stand this old guy who has been around for 30 years and that he was still the face of Christianity. It was time for a new, younger, fresher regime to take over the leadership of the movement. And they saw Paul as a threat to the spotlight that they so arrogantly desired. They figured if they were going to be on top, they had to go after the man who was on top. And so... Verse 17, they proclaimed Christ out of selfish ambition, thinking to cause Paul distress in his imprisonment. Why do they think the preaching of the gospel would cause him distress? See, because they thought that he was just like them. You see, their arrogant lust for notoriety has driven them to see themselves in competition against Paul. They hate to see him prosper. Their self-promotion was so ingrained, it had so clouded their judgment that they would hate to even hear stories of the gospel's success if that success came at the hands of Paul. And so they figure that if Paul's here, that their ministry is prospering and that they're drawing large crowds while he's holed up in a Roman prison, that he'll be distressed because his physical limitations and restrictions no longer allow him to be on the scene. See, this is mean-spirited, kick a man while he's down, selfish ambition. And I'm sure that Paul felt the sting of not being allowed to minister the gospel freely. He, he wanted to go to Spain. He wanted to lay a new foundation for the gospel there. And these selfish preachers in Rome used their platform for the gospel to rub salt in those wounds. Hey, Paul, we're out here preaching freely and unhindered. Plenty of people come to our churches. Too bad you're stuck in there. And that kind of thing. He says they don't preach from pure motives, verse 17. They didn't preach with integrity because the motive for their preaching contradicted the content of their message. They weren't sincere as we saw chapter 1, verse 10, looked at it last week. You remember last week that we said the word sincere comes from a Latin phrase that referred to uh, pottery being without wax, and then from a Greek compound word that referred to the, the pottery being judged by the sun to see if those cracks were visible. Well, these preachers' character would not stand the test of the sun. The light of God's word would reveal cracks in their integrity and would show that they were motivated by the glory of self rather than the glory of Christ. And that's where we can ask ourselves if this text has anything to say to us. What is our motivation for preaching the gospel or for being involved in the various ministries we're involved with? Because as we can see, it's possible to preach the right doctrine. It's possible to do the right things with the wrong motives. With striking insight into the human heart, Jonathan Edwards wrote the following. Listen to this. He says, there is a pretended boldness for Christ that arises from no better principle than pride. A man may be forward to expose himself to the dislike of the world and even to provoke their displeasure out of pride. For it is the nature of spiritual pride to cause men to seek distinction and singularity and so oftentimes to set themselves at war with those they call carnal that they might more be, be more highly exalted among their party. Right at the heart of the issue. Exactly what was happening in Paul's day and exactly what happens today. Do we preach the gospel to unbelievers so that we can make much of Christ or so that we can brag about how many converts we've made or how many tracts we've given out or even how many people have rejected us Oh, I got turned down by six people today. People are strange. 
do we come to church? And do we come to grace life and Bible study? Because we want to show everyone who will pay attention that Jesus is so glorious that he delightfully compels us to devote all that time to worshiping him. Or do we do it to keep up appearances? Somebody's, if I'm not there, somebody's going to notice. I don't want them thinking that I'm not spiritual. I'm not a mature Christian. We serve in ministry so that Jesus will be exalted and be made to look as satisfying as he is to as many people as possible. Or do we do it to be noticed by other Christians and pastors and leaders, to be thought of as spiritual by our friends? Faithfulness in ministry includes the right motives as well as the right doctrine. Whether, to seeking, whether seeking to cause others distress or exalting ourselves and not the glory of God, we need to put off impure motives and minister the gospel with integrity. We need to minister out of love, out of goodwill, like the second group of preachers that Paul mentions. Go back up to verse 15. He says, Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So alongside this envious, contentious, self-seeking group of preachers were a number of men who loved Paul, who desired God's best for him. And his imprisonment motivated these men to preach as well. But rather than trying to cause Paul distress, they were motivated by the, the hope of blessing his heart, by stepping up and filling the evangelistic gap that was left by his imprisonment picking up the slack of a wounded comrade in arms, as it were. They wanted to help Paul by continuing, in his, to continuing his mission for him in ways that became impossible due to his circumstances. And notice, that motivation of goodwill and love is informed by their knowledge. Verse 16, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. See, the love and the goodwill of this dear group of dear brothers is grounded upon their knowledge of God's sovereign purpose in Paul's ministry. He says, they know I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. And that word appointed was a military term. It spoke of a special assignment like guard duty or defense of a strategic position. You see, the, 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 this imprisonment was not God's way of taking Paul off the battlefield. It was a special assignment in the continuing battle. The Praetorian Guard was under special assignment from Nero to guard Paul, but Paul was under special assignment from the Lord Jesus to bring the gospel to the Praetorian Guard. Marvel at the providence of God. And these brothers knew that. They knew that that was his appointment. And so rather than seeing his imprisonment as a hindrance, they saw it as the outworking of his divine assignment. And they heard of his faithfulness in that special assignment, and it emboldened them to continue to preach faithfully in whatever sphere of influence that they had, not fearing the consequences. And so there were some who were preaching from envy and strife, and some from goodwill. The latter do it out of love because they know that Paul is under divine assignment from the Lord Jesus to defend the gospel in the highest of places. But the former... Proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, thinking to cause him distress while he's in prison. And you know, that, that couldn't be easy. Paul rejoices, but it wasn't easy. In his commentary on this passage, Pastor John says, one of the most discouraging experiences for a servant of God is that of being falsely accused by fellow believers, especially co-workers in the church. To be maligned by an unbeliever is to be expected. To be maligned by another believer is unexpected. The pain runs very deep when one's ministry is slandered, misrepresented, and unjustly criticized by fellow preachers and teachers of the gospel. End quote. So how would Paul react to being maligned? Not by opponents, not by unbelievers, but by fellow preachers of Christ. What was his response? Verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. That's just great. What then? 
Paul, these, these arrogant, selfish preachers are using the, the gospel as a platform to give you a hard time. They're envious of you. They're contentious. And they're dragging your name through the mud throughout this, the capital city of the Roman Empire. And Paul says, so what? They're preaching Christ. They're preaching Christ. The gospel is being proclaimed. But they're, ha- they're celebrating the fact that you're in prison. Well, so am I. I've been able to preach the gospel to four different guards for six hours at a time every day for the last two years. And many in the household of Caesar himself are now more sincere followers of Jesus than they ever were of Nero. My dear Philippians, I thank the Lord for your sincere and earnest concern for my welfare. Yes, I am in prison. Yes, there are preachers who seek to malign me. But I want you to know that in both cases, the sovereign Lord has ordained these difficulties for the purpose of advancing the gospel. Even in the midst of these trials, indeed, precisely because of these trials, the Lord Jesus Christ is preached and the gospel is advanced. And so I rejoice. And in all the struggles you face, my brethren, so you also too should rejoice. See how that worked with Paul and the Philippians? They were going through it. They had persecution. They were facing opposition from Christians, from people who were inside the church, battling with each other, Euodia and Syntyche. And he's saying, look, if I can endure the persecution of fellow Christians against me and rejoice, you can too. Because my joy is where? This is is so key. What is the bottom of Paul's joy. Get down, tear down all the outer layers, dig as deep as you can go. What is the bottom of Paul's joy? It's the magnification of the Lord Jesus Christ. His joy isn't most deeply in his own prominence. He didn't find ultimate satisfaction in an easy and comfortable life without conflict. His joy isn't in making a name for himself among other Christians. If any of that was the case, there was no way he could rejoice chained 18 inches away from a Roman soldier for two solid years. But his happiness at its most foundational and its most ultimate level was about making much of Christ, no matter what the cost was to himself. And dear friends, that is what it means to be a Christian, not just a good Christian. It's what it means to be a Christian. To most fundamentally, this is what following Christ is all about. You were all, we were all born into a condition, enslaved to find happiness only in the exaltation and glorification of ourselves. That was our spiritual death, our condition. The only way natural people are made to feel happy is when they're made much of. But when the Lord Jesus invades your life like he did the Apostle Paul, when he knocks you to the ground, and turns your world upside down, when everything in your life is driven by the gospel, he frees you to find all your joy and all your satisfaction in the exaltation and magnification of someone else. Jesus. Paul can rejoice in this prison because his joy is in the exaltation of Christ and Christ will be magnified in his body. He says, chapter 1, verse 20, whether by life or by death. And I just want to plead with you this morning. Be honest with yourselves about what lies at the heart of your happiness. What is the bottom of your joy at the deepest, most ultimate level of your soul? When you strip away everything else, what makes you happy? Is it fine circumstances, an easy life without conflict, a good reputation, You're known to be the best in what you do. Prominence, recognition, exaltation of yourself. Or is the bottom of your joy in the exaltation of your Lord? Paul's ministry was so driven by the gospel that even being unjustly imprisoned for two years, being taunted and maligned by his brothers, by other Christians, fellow preachers of the gospel, couldn't steal his joy. Couldn't steal his joy because his joy wasn't in in those things. His joy was in the magnification of Christ. And Christ was being magnified in his circumstances. May it be so with all of us 
May God grant that the bottom of our joy that would makes us tick is the glory of God in Christ manifested for all to see. Let's pray. Oh, Father, bring glory to your name and even bring glory to your name through us. Everything in us wants to see you put on display. We can decrease if you increase. We can labor in, in obscurity if you're put on display, if you're glorified, if you're worshiped, if you're feared and known as great among the nations. That is where all of our happiness is. We don't care for our personal circumstances. We lay them down at the foot of the cross to take up our cross and follow you. Only glorify your name. Lord Jesus, that's what you said to the Father when you were contemplating your death. My soul has become deeply troubled. What shall I say? Deliver me from this hour? This is the hour for which I have come. But Father, glorify your name. That was the comfort that the Lord Jesus had in the darkest hour. And so in our much less dark, but nevertheless dark hours, we would pray, Father, glorify your name. Grant that we would see you. Grant that others would see you in us because we love that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For more information about the ministry of the Grace Life Pulpit, visit at www.thegracelifepulpit.com. Copyright by the Grace Life Pulpit. All rights reserved.